Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another episode of Friendly Friday, a weekly series where we take a look at budget-friendly standard for modern decks, and this week we're taking a look at Mono Black in Standard, a deck playing all the good black cards that are legal in Standard. So let's dive right into it here, starting out with our 1-drops, where we have the full 4 copies of Fatal Push as our nice cheap removal spell against the aggressive decks. We also have a main deck copy of Argyll's Bloodfast, which is a very nice one against the more controlling decks, letting us draw a card at the cost of 2 life and 2 mana, which is going to get out of hand very quickly. And if we ever get to 5 or less life, we get to transform the Bloodfast into a land that we can use to sacrifice our creatures to gain life equal to their toughness. Then we also have a main deck copy of Cast Down, along with a few extra copies in the sideboard as an additional cheap spot removal spell. We have the full 4 copies of Glinsleaf Siphoner as a 2 mana 2-1 two that when she enters the battlefield we gain an energy, also has manas so can easily attack past one blocker from the opponent, and whenever she attacks she also gains one energy, and at the beginning of our upkeep we can pay 2 energy and 1 life to draw an extra card, so both a threat and a way to draw extra cards, so shines against more controlling decks. And we're still playing for Siphoners despite not having any Aether Hubs in the mana base, just because Aether Hub would not work out with all the double and triple black cards in the deck. But we do still have a small energy sub theme, as we'll see in a second, with Aether Sphere Harvester, so we might be able to draw cards with Siphoner right away without having to attack first. Then the other two drop in the main deck is four copies of Gifted Aetherborn, two mana for a 2-3 with Death Touch and Lifelink, so just a very efficient threat that gains us some life against the aggressive decks, and also combines nicely with card like Argyll's Bloodfast, gaining the life back that we lose, so we can keep drawing extra cards. Then we have two copies of Aether Sphere Harvester, a 3 mana vehicle that's a 3-5 with flying. Crew cost is only 1, so we can tap any creature in our deck to crew it. When the Harvester enters the battlefield, we gain 2 energy, and we can spend an energy to give the Harvester lifelink until end of turn. And of course, the Harvester combines nicely with the Siphoner with the small energy sub theme, so we can maybe draw cards with Siphoner right away, or just uh, gain more life with the Harvester if we're not interested in drawing cards. Next up we have Doomfall, which is a nice versatile card. We can either take a look at the opponent's hand and make them exile a non-land card, or the opponent has to exile a creature that they have in play. So even against control decks that might not have a lot of creatures, we can still use Doomfall to good effect by making the opponent discard. We're also playing with one copy of Never to Return, which can destroy a creature or Planeswalker, and then the Aftermath of Return lets us exile a card from a graveyard and make a 2-2 zombie token. Then we're playing the full 4 copies of Dreadshade, which is one of the payoff cards for being in a mono black deck. Triple black for a 3-3 creature that we can spend 1 black mana to give Dreadshade plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, which is a very powerful ability. Then we have 4 copies of Hour of Glory, which is our budget replacement for Vraska's Contempt. While Hour of Glory cannot exile Planeswalkers and doesn't gain any life, there is still a small upside in that if it exiles a creature and the exiled creature is a god, we get to take a look at the opponent's hand and exile a god with the same name. So if the opponent happens to have multiple Scarab gods in their hand after we exile one, we get a little bit of value, and the uh, same goes for Hazoret. Next up we have 3 copies of Gonti, Lord of Luxury, 4 mana for a 2-3 with Death Touch, and when Gonti enters the battlefield, we get to take a look at the top 4 cards of the opponent's library, we get to exile one of those cards, and at any point, we get to cast the exiled card even if Gonti is already dead, and we can spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast the exiled spell. So Gonti is always a nice 2 for 1, and can make for some nice surprises, and the opponent has to kind of play around their entire deck, which is a difficult thing to do. Then we also have one copy of Ravenous Chupacabra, 4 mana for a 2-2, when it enters the battlefield we get to destroy one of the opponent's creatures. We also have a 1 of Eldest Reborn, 5 mana Saga, when the Eldest Reborn enters the battlefield each opponent has to sacrifice a creature or planeswalker, so also effective against creatureless control decks. Then on the second chapter, each opponent has to discard a card, and on the third chapter we get to return a creature or planeswalker from any graveyard to the battlefield under our control. So a nice 3 for 1. Then we have two copies of Liliana Death's Majesty, that can make 2-2 zombie tokens while fueling the graveyard, and her minus 3 ability can return a creature from our graveyard to the battlefield, and it's also a zombie in addition to its other types, so synergizes nicely with her plus 1 ability. And a great creature to return with Liliana is Noxious Gearhulk, a bigger version of Ravenous Chupacabra. At 6 mana it's a 5-4 with Menace, 
and when the Noxious Gear Hulk enters the battlefield, we get to destroy another target creature and gain life equal to the destroyed creature's toughness. And unlike Ravenous Chupacabra, we can also kill our own creatures, so that could be useful if we really need to gain life in a certain spot. Then going over the mana base, we have one copy of Desert of the Glorified, which we can cycle for two mana, and also combines nicely with our four copies of Ifner Deadlands, where we can sacrifice a desert to put two minus one minus one counters on target creature. Then we also have two copies of Memorial to Folly, which we can sacrifice to return a creature from our graveyard to our hand, and then 18 basic swamps, and as you may have noticed we're not playing any Cabal Strongholds, just because we have too many non-swamp lands, and I think the utility of Memorial to Folly and If Nerdad lands is uh, worthwhile, that we probably should not be playing any Cabal Strongholds in the deck. Then going over the sideboard, we have the full four copies of Duress against control decks, an additional Bloodfast also comes in against control, Sorcerer Spyglass is a nice versatile answer to Planeswalkers and other various permanents, then three more copies of Cast Down against the aggressive decks or against the green creature decks that might have very large creatures we need to deal with. Then three copies of Knight of Malice which can come in against white decks, especially blue-white control struggles to deal with Knight of Malice. Then we also have an additional Doomfall as additional discard that we can also bring in against control decks that might have some uh, very powerful creatures in the sideboard like Lyra Dawnbringer or Torrential Geralk that we can still get rid of with the Doomfall. Then a Bontus Last Reckoning, which also shines against the green decks that put up a lot of creatures in play. And then a Scavenger Grounds, which is also a desert we can sacrifice to exile all graveyards, and combines nicely with the deserts in the main deck as well. So that comes in against all the graveyard decks. So that's the deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play. And I don't think we want to keep a one lander. Ah, this looks better. And do we want to keep Aetherborn on top? I think we do. Just to have an additional creature in case they have a removal spell for the first one. And it does go nicely with our Bloodfast, so... Yeah, I'll keep it. And then lead with the Memorial. Turn 2 we can play Aetherborn, turn 3 we can... play a second Aetherborn plus Fatal Push. And alright, we're up against the red deck. So these Aetherborns are going to be pretty useful. Fully expect the uh, first Aetherborn to die here. Could have also considered pushing the Lava Runner so that they can't cast Wizard's Lightning as a removal spell for the Aetherborn. But uh, next turn we can still use a Fatal Push if we want to. And we picked up another one. And the Skirk Prospector is interesting, so not sure what that means. Could maybe have a small Goblin theme or a God Pharaoh's Gift uh, sub-theme. But I think I like attacking. See what happens. Bon takes it. And I'll play another Aetherborn. And keep up Fatal Push. Since I imagine if your opponent had a Wizard's Lightning they would have used it already. So don't want to Fatal Push a Lava Runner if we don't have to. Alright, opponent's gonna power out a Hazrat but she's pretty far from being able to attack or block. I think I'm fine using a Fatal Push here. Alright, Liliana, pretty far from casting her. So let's attack for four. Then we play Bloodfast and get to keep up Fatal Push. So this turn is going to be important for the opponent. If they get to empty their hand and Hazrat can start attacking and blocking, then things could get out of hand. Soulscar Mage, but our opponent with the Sunscorch Desert, unable to cast a Chain Whirler here, and Flame of Keld instead. All right, that's a way to attack and block with Hazrat, I guess. So opponent discards their hand. They had a Crasher still in hand. See if her opponent gets in there with Hazret. They do. Don't actually mind. Since now we can attack with our Aetherborns. And I'm fine pushing the Soulscar Mage here. Since Soulscar Mage can uh, potentially shrink down our Aetherborns. Ooh, Dreadshade was a great draw. So let's attack. And we're definitely out racing Hazret here with the double Aetherborn. And then play Dreadshade. 
If we draw a few extra lands, we can also shrink down Hazret with the If Nur Dad lands, potentially. Bonan does now draw some extra cards. They decide to still play out an extra land so they can play second Flame of Geld. Alright. So they drew two lands and a Flame of Geld, which isn't great. They could have still discarded a land to Hazret, but they decided not to. Alright, it's on tap. So now Hazret's gonna stay on defense. Can't really make any great attacks. If we attack with everyone, we can triple pump or dread shade, so it doesn't die if our opponent blocks it with Hazret. So our opponent's likely to block Aetherborn instead, but then we do get to punch them for 8, which seems pretty good, but we would be giving up one of our Aetherborns, and then our opponent gets to draw a few cards. If they find a Lightning Strike or a Braid for dread shade, that would be bad. I guess with Flame of Keld approaching the third chapter, even a Braid or Lightning Strike would be able to kill the Dreadshade even if we do leave up some black mana to pump it, since those would deal two extra damage. So I guess we do just attack with everyone. Pwn blocks a Dreadshade, alright, don't mind that. So we get to save a Dreadshade. And get in for four. I think this is a good scenario for us. Pwn falls down to six, we gain four up to 25. Pwn can potentially deal a ton of damage here with a Flame of Keld. Alright, Gitu Lava Runner still doesn't have haste. And a Wizard's Lightning on Dreadshade. And Hazret discards another Hazret, which deals four damage to us. And Hazret's gonna stay on defense. Alright, Aethersphere Harvester, great draw. It's gonna be a two-turn clock in the air. Can't really attack with our Aetherborns with Hazret back to block. So yeah, let's play Harvester. Say go. Drawing a fourth land would be nice at some point. Especially if we can find a Lightning Strike with Conti. So Flame of Kel triggers. But again, Hazret can probably not attack yet. And Rapun just picked up a land. So things are looking good for us. Harvester can get there in two turns. Opponent can't really afford to attack. But they're going to anyways. So that deals 7 to us because of Flame of Keld. And there's a Swamp. So now we get to Crude Harvester with Conti. And get in there with everyone. Opponent's going to be forced to chum block with their Lava Runner. And our opponent scoops it up. Alright, how do we want to sideboard against a Monoret with Flame of Keld? I do like Cast Downs as more cheap removal. Doomfall could be good to clean up Hazret potentially. But that's about it. Then what do we take out? Bloodfast can probably go. I uh, did not see any Chain Warlords and our opponent did play a Colorless Land. So they might not have any Chain Warlords, which means that uh, Siphoner could still stay in, although she's a bit of a liability still. Losing life is not where we want to be in this matchup. So I can definitely see taking out at least two copies. What else do we want to cut? Never to return is not amazing. Eldest Reborn could be a little slow, but it is also an extra answer to Hazret. So I think this configuration is fine. Could replace two more Siphoners with Knight of Malice just to dodge Chain Warlord, but if I don't see Chain Warlord, I think I prefer Siphoner over Knight of Malice. So yeah, let's try this. And you could make an argument for Duress against the Flame of Keld version, but it's just such a bad top deck and doesn't really deal with a resolved Hazret. And there's Hour of Glory, so yeah, I think I keep this. We have four Fatal Push and a bunch of uh, cast downs as well now that we can draw into for cheap interaction. The Aetherborns as well. Could get run over if our opponent has a fast start. Alright, turn on Bowman Courier. Alright, there's a cast down. So next turn we'll decide if we want to play Siphoner or cast down. There's a Kenra. Earthshaker Kenra is a potential reason to want to keep in Never to Return. But I doubt the Flame of Keld version is going to be too heavy on Chandras, so you don't really need the Planeswalker removal. Of course, Vraska's Contempt would be a little better than Hour of Glory in this matchup. Just a life gain is pretty relevant. So I think we want to cast down over Siphoner here. 
and I'm not sure yet if we want to cast down Bowmet Courier or Kenra. Depends what our opponent does here. Alright, so opponent moves to combat. Think I'm fine killing the Bowmet Courier since we have Chupacabra in two turns to deal with uh, Kenra. And uh, Gontis also block Kenra pretty well. Alright, Memorial to Folly is a nice pickup, so we can play that plus Siphoner this turn. And I fully expect Siphoner to die one way or the other. But next turn we get to untap with lots of options at 4 mana. And they're all pretty good. So Lightning Strike on Siphoner, don't mind that trade. Let's see if they have a Flame of Keld as one of their last cards. Nope, Hazret. Alright, so Hour of Glory it is. And let's hope to snipe a second Hazret. So I don't think we can afford to wait until draw step, since then her opponent gets to use Hazret with her discard mode again. So I think I'm just going to have to main phase the Hour of Glory. If we had more life, we could maybe afford to wait until draw step to maybe catch another Hazret that they draw for the turn. Alright, opponent just has a mountain in hand. We will take some damage from the Scanra, but in next turn we should be able to stabilize. Opponent plays out their land. So one unknown card in hand. Opponent says go. Alright, so could play Eldest Reborn, could play Chupacabra, could play Gonti. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. So the disadvantage of Gonti is that if our opponent has something like an Abrade in hand, they can kill Gonti and get in for two, while Chupacabra and Eldest Reborn deal with uh, Kenra. The disadvantage of Eldest Reborn and Chupacabra is that uh, Kenra can potentially get Eternalized next turn for six mana, which would be pretty bad for us. So I think we just play Gonti. And since we have a second Gonti, playing the first one and getting it killed is also not the end of the world. And I think we just take the Bowmet Courier so we can play it this turn. And have an extra blocker. Alright, so that worked out. Opponent has the six lands, so Chupacabra or Eldest Reborn would not have worked out very well. So they could have a Chain Whirler here, and that would make an, a block with Gonti bad, but more likely our opponent just wants to eternalize the Kenra. So I think I uh, just block with the Gonti. And they're gonna keep it in the graveyard, which is fine. Alright, Noxious Gearhulk is not bad. Could play another Gonti. So yeah, I think we attack with Gonti and then play another Gonti. And then try to find another cheap card we can uh, play. Alright, there's a Shock. Skirk Prospector. Wizard's Lightning, I don't think we want... So it's either Shock or Prospector. Prospector we can play right away and would also let us ramp into Noxious Gearhulk. I think I like Prospector more than Shock, since we have plenty of removal in hand already. And Shock doesn't deal with uh, Kenra. So yeah, let's grab a Prospector and play it. And say go. So if our opponent eternalizes the Kenra, they probably prevent Gonti from blocking and I'll jump with the Bowmet Courier. And then we can play Noxious Gearlk next turn, gain some life back, and be in a pretty good spot. Alright, get to untap. Gifted Aetherborn's not bad, but here we want to attack for one. And then play Noxious Gearlk. Leave back two blockers in case of Ancrop Crash or Shenanigans. Or if we need to chum block a Hazret for some reason. So sacrifice Prospector. And run out to Gearhulk. Take out Kenra, gain four, and that's gonna put us out of burn range. And now we can start clocking our opponent for five with the Noxious Gearhulk. Play Aetherborn. And keep up Fatal Push. Alright, looks like our opponent's flooding out a bit. Dreadshade is a nice pickup. So let's get in for 7. A Lightning Strike on the Aetherborn. Opponent takes 5. Play a Dreadshade. 
and that's lethal next turn. And our opponent concedes, alright, so managed to beat a mono red Flame of Keld onto the next one. Alright, we're on the draw, and this hand looks okay. Got some interaction with Fatal Push and Hour of Glory. Siphoner that uh, can maybe start getting some card advantage. And Gonti's always a two for one. Turn one, Kumena Speaker. Alright, so up against Merfolk. Don't mind running out if Ifner Dadlands here in case we need to Fatal Push a uh, Lord on turn two, just to be mana efficient so we can still play the Siphoner on the following turn. And yep, there's a Mistbinder, which I'm happy to Fatal Push here. Had we played Memorial Tapped on turn one, then we can't Fatal Push the Lord. And then on turn two, we're likely forced to Fatal Push instead of being able to deploy the Siphoner. And we didn't have a turn three play anyways in hand. Could even consider trading the Siphoner if our opponent uh, gives us the opportunity. Just because our hand is pretty well set up for the late game. Alright, another Mistbinder, so not gonna get the opportunity to trade. So we will take some damage this turn and next turn. Alright, unsummon on the Glint Sleeve. Let's see what we draw for a turn. Dreadshade, alright, so we can... I think just play Memorial Tapped and then play Glint Sleeve instead of playing Dreadshade. While the Dreadshade could trade for the opponent's creatures, it forces us to play the Deadlands and take 2 damage from our lands. And then we can't be guaranteed to have 4 mana next turn, which I think is pretty important. So let's replay Siphoner, gain an extra energy, so next turn we can draw a card with it if we want to. But I'm also fine trading it for a Mistbinder if our opponent attacks with it. So don't mind our spot, depends what our opponent does this turn. If they have more lords, then we could be in trouble. Deep Root Elite, but no follow-up Merfolk. And yeah, opponent doesn't want to trade Mistbinder, so we'll take 3 down to 11. And we'll get to draw a card with our Glint Sleeve. Alright, so Infinite Hour of Glory. I think we still just want to run out Gonti first, since that's a pretty decent blocker here. I guess we take the Merfolk Branch Walker. Since Jade Bear is just a 1 mana 1 1, it's more mana efficient to take the Jade Bear, so we can go Jade Bear plus 4 drop next turn. But I think I just take the Branch Walker still. And say go. And now we just want to start pointing our removal spells at the opponent's creatures every turn. Jungleborn Pioneer is pretty good in combination with the Deep Root Elite, but Conti has Death Touch, so we're still gonna be able to trade. So definitely just trading for whatever our opponent attacks with here. Alright, picked up Gifted Aetherborn. So we do have the option of going Aetherborn plus Dreadshade. The downside of Dreadshade plus Aetherborn is that it will cost us 2 life because of the Ifner Dad lands. While if we spread out all these double and triple black cards, then we don't have to take any damage, so it might actually be worth it to play the Branch Walker off of the two dead lands and then play Aetherborn. Don't have a ton of tap lands left in the deck, so I don't think we have to be worried about drawing a tap land and not being able to play it. So let's run out uh, Aetherborn, which I think is better than Dreadshade in the spot just because I want to actually trade for the opponent's creatures. And there's Kumena, yeah, that's what I don't want to see. I guess the upside of uh, playing Dreadshade last turn is that we get to play Hour of Glory plus Aetherborn on the following turn, which might have been better. So our opponent's going to go on the beatdown plan, putting plus one plus one counters everywhere. Bloodfast, so we can go Bloodfast plus Hour of Glory. And we just want to main phase this Hour of Glory. Might still be in trouble here. Since the opponent did get to put counters everywhere. Opponent's going to use the Hashap Oasis. Yep. Let's see if they get in with everyone. Or if they keep back the Merfolk Mistbinder. Alright, everyone gets in there. So we're forced to chum block. Since, yeah, we would gain 2, but then take 12. So, yeah. 
this isn't great. Need to top deck another Aetherborn, for example. Would be pretty good. Let's transform the Bloodfasts. So we can Doomfall plus Dreadshade or Doomfall plus Hour of Glory. But those don't actually do it. So yeah, I think we're dead here. If we play Dreadshade, we can block with it and sack it to the Temple to gain a bit of life back, but that's not a winning strategy. Just ended up with a few too many expensive removal spells in hand. If Hour of Glory was Vraska's Contempt, we would have been at 6 and could have gone to 8 here. Which might have made a difference, but maybe still not enough given the second hash of Oasis. So I think we just played Red Shade and say go. And then try to Hour of Glory something. Since Doomfall is definitely not going to do it. Merfolk Branchwalker can put a counter somewhere with a Deep Root Elite. But we kind of have to count on our opponents not going all in here. Otherwise we're dead. Alright, opponent sends everyone so we can block Deep Root Elite, kill this and then still take 6. So yeah, we're just dead here. Alright, so drew a few too many Hour of Glory and not enough uh, cheap removal. So we're going to remedy that by bringing in Cast Downs. Pontus Last Reckoning seems great here. Doomfall seems weak. Uh, Bloodfast seems a bit weak. Don't mind Knight of Malice just as a good blocker. Since I think the Glinsleaf Siphoner is going to have a hard time attacking past the opponent's blockers, especially if they have the uh, Jungleborn Pioneer. And then I think I lag the rest. So I need to make one more cut here. I guess I can cut one Knight of Malice. This seems fine. Would like to be on the play. And unfortunately can't keep a one lander. I'll keep and then hope to scry something good to the top. Swamp can go to the bottom. I'll lead with Memorial since I definitely want to keep this fatal push for one of their lords. Not gonna fire it off on the Kumena speaker. Alright, Liliana is the plan for the late game. So I'll say go. Deep Root Elite, I'll also happily fatal push. Yep. Definitely when it's played on turn 2 and can accumulate quite a few plus 1 plus 1 counters over time. Eh, time to play a Dreadshade. Which is pretty decent in the matchup since it can block uh, pretty well. It's a little weak to unsummon I guess. Yep, but we didn't have a play for next turn anyway. So I'm surprised our opponent main phase the unsummon. So let's uh, run out the Dreadshade again. So our opponent seems to have kept a rather slow hand. Deep Root Waters is an annoying one. Since we don't have any enchantment removal in mono black. And keeping in Doomfall just to try and snipe Deep Root Water seems like a poor plan. Alright, we're just gonna try and make our own tokens. And play defense with the Dreadshade. And Liliana minus 7 is definitely a real thing in this matchup. Alright, opponent's gonna swarm the board here. So they could put the counter on Kumena speaker. And then we either have to trade for Dreadshade or Chump with the Zombie token, which are both pretty bad options. I think I'm still fine Chumping with the Zombie token. Just to keep our Dreadshade alive. And then next turn we get to make an extra Zombie, play Harvester. An Oxus Skirulk in the graveyard, so that's also a nice target for Liliana's minus 3 ability. Let's play Harvester. And I guess we can play a second Harvester now, instead of keeping up uh, Dreadshade's ability. Still gonna just play defense here. Opponent has two cards still in hand. Alright, and they're gonna say go. And Fatal Push was a nice draw. We could minus on the Noxious Gearhulk, kill the Kumena Speaker, but that doesn't seem great. So I'm just gonna keep plussing, making more zombies. Could also use the If Near Dead Lance to put some minus one, minus one counter somewhere. Could also use the Memorial to get back a creature from the graveyard, like Dreadshade or the Noxious Gearhulk. 
That seems pretty good actually. So yeah, let's use Memorial on the Gear Hulk. We won't have the lands to cast the Gear Hulk, but any extra land does it. I guess we should have also just tapped the If Near Dead lands there. And we could get in there with Harvesters, but I think I'm fine just playing defense, since if we get in with a Harvester and they have an Unsummon, then things could get uh, tricky. Right, Deep Root Elite, so opponent's committing. But now a Liliana minus 7 looks pretty appealing. So let's untap, cast down as well. So if we attack with Dreadshade, our opponent probably just chumps it with a Merfolk token. So that's not really gonna do much for us. So I think we just minus 7 Liliana. And then we get to attack with our Harvesters. And our opponent scoops it up, alright. So on to game 3 against Merfolk. I think I still like our sideboard plan. Deep Root Water is certainly annoying, but I don't think we want to bring in Duress or Doomfall to try and fight that fight. So yeah, let's just run it back. And I don't mind keeping this hand. It doesn't have any actual spot removal, so I do want to draw a Fatal Push cast down at some point. But this is a pretty good start. Alright, there's a Gonti as well, so I've got a very nice curve out here. 2, 3, 4, 5. And a Deep Root Elite on 2 again. So that's the kind of card that can get out of hand. But we drew the Fatal Push. Yeah, I think I just want to Fatal Push the Deep Root Elite. Not get too fancy. And if we let them untap, there's a risk of them playing a green source and having Blossoming Defense or something like that. And Fatal Push is not going to kill Kumena anyways. So it doesn't make too much sense to keep Fatal Push for that. Let's turn out Dreadshade. I'm fine if this gets uh, countered. Yep, Essence Scatter. Not a card you typically see out of Merfolk, but could also be in their sideboard. But I would rather resolve Conti or Chupacabra. Right, Merfolk Branch Walker's fine. Not very threatening. Finds an island, so it's not going to attack past or Aetherborns. And same goes for Kumena Speaker. And if they unsummon Gonti, we still get value out of it, so. Let's play Gonti. Branch Walker, Pioneer, Deep Root Waters, so definitely not Deep Root Waters. So, do we want a Branch Walker or do we want Pioneer? Kind of like Branch Walker since it lets us play Branch Walker and Aetherborn next turn, which is a nice play if we don't go for Chupacabra or Hour of Glory. And that helps us find land 5 for Eldest Reborn. So yeah, let's take a Branch Walker. See if they have an Unsummon end of turn. They could try and tempo us out by Unsummoning Gonti and then going on the beatdown plan, but doesn't look like it. Jade Bearer, that's fine. Puts a counter on the Branch Walker into Merfolk Mistbinder. Alright, so here I'm probably fine trading for the Branch Walker and then killing the Mistbinder. All right, so that happens, still at 17. And here Chupacabra is pretty tempting since it kills the Mistbinder and can trade for a creature. Opponent could have another Essence Scatter, I suppose, which would make Branch Walker plus Aetherborn better. I guess I dig that as well, since I do want to find an extra land here with the Branch Walker if we get lucky. All right, nice. And now play the Aetherborn. Alright, no Essence Scatters. Another Hashap Oasis. And there's Deep Root Elite as their last card. Alright, I definitely like our spot. Got a lot of removal. Eldest Reborn to pull ahead. And our opponent can't make any great attacks. I'm fine taking 3 here, I think. Since next turn we'll kill the Mistbinder and then Kumena Speaker can no longer make great attacks. I think I'm fine still pulling out our land. Let's just play a Chupacabra. And kill the Mistbinder. If your opponent draws exactly Jungleborn Pioneer, we kind of get punished for not killing Deep Root Elite. But otherwise, I think we're fine. Alright, Silver Gill Adept for 5 mana. It's not a bad one. 
So they could put the counter on the Kumina speaker, so it can still attack. Instead, they decide to put it on Jade Bearer, and they picked up a land. All right, they can't really attack us. I guess this is a good spot for us to play Eldest Reborn. Since all the opponent's creatures are more or less equal, and I don't really want an Hour of Glory with a Deep Root Elite when they're empty-handed. So I imagine they sacrifice Silver Gill Adept. Yep. Still don't think we want to start attacking, since if they top deck a Lord, then could take a lot of damage on the way back. Next turn we can also use Ifner Deadlands if we want to, to take out a Deep Root Elite, sacrificing the Desert. Alright, they did pick up Jungleborn Pioneer, so as it turns out, playing Hour of Glory on Deep Root Elite might have been slightly better, but on the other hand, then our opponent could have just sacrificed a random token to the Eldest Reborn, so I think we're still fine. Opponent's gonna make some attacks. So here we have an interesting spot, we can double block one of them with Branchwalker Chupacabra, and block the other one with the Aetherborn, but I kind of like keeping the Aetherborn back since it blocks the other creature so well, so... Don't mind trading here. And then taking 3 down to 11. So our opponent's empty handed, so they don't have to discard anything. Ooh, but another Gonti was great here. So definitely like Gonti over anything else. And we find Pioneer. It's probably better than Kumena if we don't have any other Merfolk, so. Let's take the Pioneer. Although I guess a 2-4 blocks pretty well. But I think just having the extra blockers could be useful if your opponent tries to go wide. I'm definitely fine trading off Gonti if your opponent tries to attack, since then we can get back the Gonti from the graveyard with Eldest Reborn. Jade Bearer gets two counters thanks to the Deep Root Elite. At some point we'll get rid of the Deep Root Elite, but don't think we have to quite yet. And do want to keep in mind their opponent did have a Tempest Caller in their deck which can tap down all our blockers. So do have to be a little bit careful. Opponent's gonna sack Hashap Oasis. Targeting the Hexproof Merfolk. So definitely blocking that one with Conti. And then I think we just make some trades, honestly. Since if Tempest Scholar is a way we can lose, this is a way to prevent that from happening. So Eldest Reborn has a lot of options, but I like just getting back a Gonti. Could go with Chupacabra, kill Deep Root Elite. But yeah, let's go with Gonti. Can also Liliana Minus on Chupacabra. And Gonti finds <laughs> Deep Root Elite. And yeah, let's just Liliana. Minus on Chupacabra. And kill the Deep Root Elite. And then play Deep Root Elite. Alright, so now uh, we're pretty far ahead. Opponent only has the one Merfolk in place, even if they top deck Kumena, it's not going to be too effective. Can also sacrifice Memorial to get back something. And Noxious Gearhulk. Alright, so this game should be over. Let's play Noxious Gearhulk. Kill Jade Bearer and start attacking. Just uh, too much removal for the Merfolk deck to handle. I guess Gonti is not amazing against uh, synergy based decks since you end up getting cards like Deep Root Elite that don't really do much for you. But just a 2-3 Death Touch body is pretty good and then if you find some random Merfolk blockers that's good as well. Opponent is gonna fall pretty low here. And next turn they should be dead. Alright, opponent's at 2. Don't think they have any top decks that can save them at this point. Kumena Speaker, yep. Alright, let's get in there. Alright, on to the next one. 
All right, we're on the play. And this hand seems acceptable. Could use some more lands, but uh, Fatal Push and Aetherborn can buy us some time if we're up against a more aggressive deck. Turn one Mountain into Soulscar Mage. It's a fine recipient for Fatal Push. All right, Bloodfast, not the best in this matchup, but it can technically gain you some life as well if you get too low. So let's run out Aetherborn. And it's gonna get met by a Lightning Strike. That's fine. Alright, so this is a painful Dread Shade if we want to play it. But I think it beats running out uh, Bloodfast. It's gonna get met by a Lightning Strike as well. At least our opponent's not pressuring us. And now we can run out the Bloodfast and uh, get an activation out of it. All right, Ancrop Crasher is gonna be a little painful. Would have preferred to see a Chain Warlord here that we could have killed with the Chupacabra without taking three damage. Still don't mind drawing a card here since we do want to get up to six. And Hour of Glory is a nice one. So is Conti, but just gonna have to Chupacabra here since we can't afford to take three more damage from the Crasher. Say go. So Hour of Glory, a nice answer to Rekindling Phoenix and Hazret. There's the Chain Warlord. So they probably had the option to play either one of them, chose to go for the Crasher. Conti doesn't block Chain Warlord particularly well, but I don't think I want to use Hour of Glory on it since I kind of need that for Hazret or Phoenix. So I think we Gonti anyways. Maybe find a Chum Blocker. Alright, a Lightning Strike will do. So if we find a land next turn, we get to play Gear Hulk. If we don't, then we can just Lightning Strike. All right, Kenra prevents us from blocking. So definitely just blocking the Kenra with the Chupacabra here. And then we'll take three from Chain Warlor. Soulscar Mage is fine. All right. So I think we're doing fine. We have an answer to Hazard or Phoenix, which are the scariest cards our opponent can have. And uh, Aetherborn's a nice pickup here as well. So let's play Aetherborn, say go, and get to keep up Lightning Strike. Another Earthshaker Kenra. Yep. Still have Conti as a pretty good blocker. And another one. All right, so their point's just gonna prevent everything from blocking here. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. So we'll take five by the end of this. So let's Lightning Strike Chain Warlor and take five. And yeah, definitely transforming Bloodfast here. All right, picked up a land, so now we get to Noxious Gear Hulk, kill one of their creatures. I guess I could have considered a Lightning Strike against Kenra, so we could have Noxious Gear Hulked the Chain Warlor to gain uh, three life instead of just one. We would have taken one extra damage last turn, but gained two more, so in the end it would have been worth it. So yeah, I didn't think far enough ahead there. But for now we can just play Gear Hulk. I guess we could also just kill the Soulscar Mage, which could be annoying. And we get to gain an extra life. I guess that makes sense. And still keep up the Temple, which can also gain us life. And I'll get in with Aetherborn to gain two more. So this way we are not forced to chum block a Hasty Hazret, for example. And yep, there's Hasty Hazret. Just Hazret attacking us. I think we just take it. Untap. And then we get to Hour of Glory. And their opponent had another Hazret in hand. Oh yes. Perfect. And attack with Aetherborn. Thing that sits. Bone's gonna trade. That's fine. And I'll say go. Still have our temple up in case we need to gain life. And double if near deadlands also means we have a, another answer to Hazard potentially. Let's get in there. 
opponent takes 7. Can uh, sack Gonti. Play another Gonti. And yeah, Hazrat would do nicely. I guess Lightning Strike is also fine. So is Ancrop Crasher, but eh. Let's kill our opponent with their own card. And now we know it's unlikely they top deck another Hazrat since two already exiled and one in our hand. Chain Warlord's fine. Alright, let's play Hazrat. And then... I guess we could shrink down the Chain Warlord, but... Get in there. We had the option of using Ifner Deadlands on the Chain Whirler and also attack with Conti, but then we don't keep up the Temple, which might have been a little sketchy. Alright, so on to sideboarding against uh, Classic Mono Red. So bring in Cast Downs, bring in Knight of Malice, take out Siphoners. Take out Bloodfast, even though it did some work that game actually, just transforming and gaining life. And then Doomfall's a bit better in this matchup compared to the super fast Monoret Flame of Keld version. Although I guess Never to Return is pretty good against the Kenra. So I guess I'll still take out the Doomfall. And I think Eldest Reborn as a one of is probably okay as a curve topper. So yeah, let's uh, try this. Alright, so. Got a mono spot removal draw. So if this hand is not going to match up very well against the opponent's draw if they have a Chandra or a Hazard. But I think we keep. Bowman Courier, yep. We also have to keep in mind that Kazdown can't kill Karizev. So if your opponent plays Karizev, then we want to make sure to use Fatal Push on Karizev and cast down on the Courier. So we might not Fatal Push the Courier this turn because of that reason. Since I might just take one and see if they have a Karizav. Alright, another courier. So now I'm more likely to just want to fatal push the courier. So we don't fall too far behind. Take one down to 18. Hour of Glory is a nice one, so that's an answer to Hazard or Phoenix. So we're kind of doing it here. Need to find a creature at some point to start attacking. Crasher is going to get killed by cast down. Take one from Bowen Courier. Ooh, Harvester. It's tempting to play Harvester, but with no creature in hand, it's not that great. I think we want to cast down the Courier. The timing on this is also strange since... I think I might just want to cast down in draw step. We do give our opponent the opportunity to sacrifice a courier, but they will have to discard three cards to draw two random cards, which they probably are not going to do. And alright, so did not get punished, so if your opponent had another Ancrop Crasher, doing this uh, cast down on draw step could have ended up uh, poorly, but I think now we're fine. So we get to say go with another cast down. If we draw land five, we get to play Liliana. If we draw a creature, we get to Crew Harvester and Earthshaker Kenra. Alright, so we'll be using Cast Down on the Chain Warrior here. Take two, down to 14. And Red Shade is excellent here, as it's a blocker that can also survive a three damage effect since we have one mana up. The other option was playing Harvester so we could crew it next turn, but I like having a blocker for the Kenra this turn. Alright, so your opponent likely has removal spell, but I'm fine trading removal spell and uh, Kenra for the Dreadshade. So let's pump in response. And trade. Alright, now we get to play Liliana, make a zombie. Get to jump a Hazret if they have one. So there's land, do they have Hazrats? They don't. Alright. So nothing in the graveyard I want to really get back, so we'll keep making zombies. Play Harvester. Get in for two. 
should have attacked before playing the Harvester since now if they have an Abrade they might do it on the Harvester instead of on the Zombie. Yep. And Lightning Strike on Liliana. Alright, Bones uh, got a plan to try and kill Liliana here. Beaumont Courier is not going to do it. So they're probably just going to cycle the Courier. It's my guess. Yep. Let's keep plussing. And uh, still nothing interesting in the graveyard. So let's get in for four. And I guess I'll keep playing out my lands. And there's Glorybringer. Definitely worthy of an Hour of Glory. It's pretty fitting, Hour of Glory on the Glorybringer. But now we're out of answers for House Rat, so we do want to try and close out this game quickly. So we might just get back at Ratshade with all these swamps, that seems good. So let's target Ratshade. Attack for six. And uh, Dreadshade can now block a Hazrat pretty well. And there we go. A Dreadshade attacking as an 11-11 was going to be enough to close out the game. Alright, I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this gameplay. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for supporting the channel. And you can do so yourself as well over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd. Where you get cool rewards for supporting the channel. As well as getting us closer to our goals. Where with every goal reached we will release an additional weekly series. So if you want to see more content, Patreon is the place to go.